This is the story of the Hotel Le Bristol in Paris. During the Second World War, when the French capital was occupied by the Germans, a Jewish architect found refuge here for four years. During this time, he renovated a large part of the hotel, though no outsiders were aware of his presence. His room had no number on the door and wasn't on any lists. And he worked exclusively at night. But the architect wasn't the only one who owed his life to Le Bristol. The hotel also saved other Jews from persecution. Its discretion earned Le Bristol the name the Hotel of Silence. For its founder, Hippolyte Jamais, discretion and the protection of his guests, who ranged from high-ranking politicians and government agents to well-known celebrities and artists, were paramount. And this remains part of Le Bristol's identity to this day. What happens within these walls never leaks out. This cloak of absolute secrecy was a reason why Le Bristol was one of the only hotels in Paris to escape being seized by the Germans during World War II. While the Nazis invaded the French capital and Hitler eventually even ordered the city's destruction, the story of Le Bristol is one of solidarity, humanity, and courage. The hotel is located in the 8th arrondissement, in one of Paris's finest districts, not far from the Champs-Élysées. Le Bristol first opened its doors in 1925. Its founder, Hippolyte Jamais, aimed to create the ideal luxury hotel. The hotel was smaller back then. My father took the smallest room for us, as he'd spent a lot on the construction. They just pulled out the dresser drawer, and that was my first cradle. Hippolyte's son Pierre was born just before the hotel opened. He spent the first months of his life on the first floor, just above the service entrance, in one of the few rooms that were finished at the time. As he grew, he learned a lot from his father, like how to quickly and quietly make the right decision at the right time. After the First World War ended, Parisians were in the mood to celebrate. The streets were full of life. Women became emancipated. For many Parisians, the Roaring Twenties heralded a fresh start. The years between 1919 and 1929 were a time when fashion, art and culture flourished. They were also the years when there were no boundaries between different artistic and cultural domains, and the fashion world, which experienced its golden age during this period. The Hotel Le Bristol Paris was named after Frederick Hervey, the Earl of Bristol. His travels through Europe in the 18th century made him a symbol of the luxury traveler par excellence. Hippolyte Jamais came from a family of Parisian restaurateurs, his parents owned the famous restaurant Le Boeuf à la Mode. His deployment at the front during the First World War had a strong impact on him and influenced his later decisions regarding his hotel. Jamais bought this modest building and transformed it into the Bristol we know today. In 1925, he had the opportunity to purchase the property on the Rue du Faubourg Saint-Honoré, on which to build his hotel. He demolished the existing building to construct Le Bristol. Previously, it had been the private residence of the Comte de Castellane, a dandy who lived the high life in Paris. 
dans la vie parisienne avec une grande ville. And it was at this location uh, where Hippolyte Jamais built que, his Bristol. It was his life dream and crowning achievement. Le rêve et l'aboutissement de, de sa vie. Before the war in 1914, his father had sent him to apprentice at the reception of the Hotel Adlon in Berlin. Afterwards, he said, I want my own Adlon. That's because in the early 1920s, Paris did not yet have many luxury hotels. The Bristol was located diagonally opposite the Elysee Palace and the Ministry of the Interior. Long the political heart of Paris, this area is still the seat of power today. But over time, the big fashion labels have also taken up residence on the Rue de Faubourg Saint-Honoré and the surrounding streets. In Paris, Politics, luxury, and culture have always gone hand in hand. Together with his wife Yvonne, who also hailed from a respected family of restaurateurs, Hippolyte built a hotel which incorporated the latest construction methods. Here, the city's most famous landmark served as a role model. Ils ont décidé. They decided to build the framework entirely of metal, just like the Eiffel Tower. From that point on, a concrete construction was off the table. That was good, because a metal structure can always be torn down, rebuilt or enlarged. What's made of concrete can't be modified so easily. And because he always wanted to make improvements to the Bristol, it was constantly under construction. The bankers were impressed that the Jamais family had a solid enough backing to support these projects. Their previous ones had proven to be good projects, not just beauty projects. They were not only about expanding the hotel, but also about making it more efficient and attractive, and above all, making the hotel a place that would stand the test of time, maybe even times of crisis. This is what the Bristol looked like in its first decade. Its art deco decor would soon be mixed with classic 18th century Regence style elements, and later replaced entirely. Hippolyte Jamais purchased fine furniture, tapestries, even paintings of Marie Antoinette. Nothing was too good for his guests. He had created his Parisian Hotel Adlon. In its early years, Le Bristol did a booming business. You have to imagine a world in which people suddenly had access to things they never did before. Those who'd worked hard to achieve a certain standard of living suddenly had places to spend their wealth, nice places to spend it. So they wanted to go there and kept coming back, especially in Paris. And I think that created a certain joie de vivre, which partially explains the success of this hotel, which was very large for those days. You don't come to the Bristol just to sleep or enjoy the sights of Paris. You come to feel like you are a part of history. The artisans' know-how is extraordinary, right down to the details of the wall coverings. Everything's perfect. And it's important to incorporate that history when redecorating a room. For example, when that room tells the story of Josephine Baker, who celebrated her 50th stage anniversary at Le Bristol. Raon is one of Le Bristol's current residents. Quietly and inconspicuously, the hotel cat watches people come and go. Le Bristol is one of the few hotels which still hands out real room keys, not key cards.
Josephine Baker stayed here time and again. She spent many happy years in Paris, from the 1920s all the way through to the 1970s. The suite named after her recalls the years when American tourists descended on Paris in droves. Aboard large cruise ships like the Mauritania or the Queen Mary, they arrived at the ports of Le Havre and Cherbourg, bringing with them lots of spending money and an irrepressible love of life. They traveled on to the French capital to enjoy pleasures forbidden to them in their homeland. For example, the consumption of alcohol. Prohibition drove Americans to explore the nightlife of Paris. Over half a century later, Le Bristol dedicated this small swimming pool, shaped like a ship, to the memory of that American clientele. The days of the American craze and full guest books ended abruptly in 1929 with the great stock market crash. The crisis of 1929, the Great Depression which began in the US with Black Thursday, only reached Europe a little later. For Europeans, the crisis really began in the early 1930s. As a result, many of these rich clients were now virtually bankrupt, and therefore far fewer come to Europe. Countries abandoned the gold standard, and currencies became devalued. For European countries, that meant millions of unemployed. From then on, Le Bristol's rooms remained empty. The times of plenty were over, at least for a while. And that was a problem for Hippolyte Jamais, who had made major investments in this hotel just before the economic crisis began. There was no one around to admire the hotel's stylish new makeover. Its luxurious lounges remained empty. He successfully completed the expansion of the eight floors, each boasting 300 square meters of space they faced onto the biggest inner courtyard in Paris. Here, in this green oasis with 20 different species of birds, his guests were to relax and enjoy some respite in tough times. But now people had big worries, and Hippolyte Jamais was becoming increasingly bitter because he feared he'd be forced to give up his dream. While he'd constantly kept expanding the hotel during the boom years, now he was saddled with a mountain of debt. He could no longer afford to complete the maisonette he'd planned to build for his family on the seventh and eighth floors. He felt like a failure as a businessman and a father. He fathered 10 children, but didn't really take care of them because he was Le Bristol. It was Mama who raised us. He was a father but more of a businessman than a family man. During the Great Depression, when his hotel attracted few guests, Hippolyte Jamais worked on the many small details, inventions and special features which would eventually save Le Bristol. For instance, Le Bristol was the first hotel in Paris to have combined heating and air conditioning units. But Hippolyte Jamais' most famous invention was the magnifying mirror. There are many examples that show he was a visionary. Take those little magnifying mirrors in the bathrooms, which are now standard fixtures in every hotel around the world. 
Now they're completely normal, but they were invented by Hippolyte Jamais, though no one knows that. If he'd patented them, he'd have become a billionaire. Unfortunately, he didn't do that at the time. But that gives you an idea of the kind of hotelier he was, full of ideas, creative. It was also Hippolyte Jamais' idea to create an air raid shelter here, to create a place where people could take refuge. Yet once again, a refuge within a refuge, just in case something really dramatic happened in Paris. The lean years dragged on. Still, Hippolyte had a wealth of contacts. Bankers, restaurateurs, and politicians, who helped keep him afloat at a time when many hotels were going under. Ironically, it was only when German troops marched in and seized Paris in 1940 that the tide turned for Hippolyte Jamais and Le Bristol. As the Germans began to take control of the city and requisition its hotels, Hippolyte had to quickly come up with a plan to save his establishment. The Nazis requisitioned small, medium and large hotels according to the hierarchy of the troops who were to be lodged there, whether they were officers or soldiers. Cinemas were reserved for them, and bordels too, and all the signage was in German. In roughly the same spot where the hotel bar now stands, Hippolyte Jamais built his famous air raid shelter. It was his ace in the hole. No other hotel could offer its guests such a sense of security. As Germany had not yet declared war on the United States, Hippolyte Jamais took a big gamble. I think he realized very quickly that history was sealing the fate of Paris, and with it that of his business. And of course, he had this famous air raid shelter. So he went to see the American ambassador in Paris. Hippolyte asked him to tell all his compatriots, or at least his diplomats in Paris, that they should come and stay here, so that this place would remain almost neutral, as far as that was possible at the time. So, American diplomats settled in at Le Bristol. Although the embassy had previously dealt with the Hôtel de Crillon, the Americans were swayed by the air raid shelter, as well as the fact that Hippolyte let the embassy staff have the rooms for free. That proved to be another clever move on his part. After American ambassador William Burlett and his entourage moved in, Le Bristol was not only protected from being seized by the Germans, it was also fully booked for the first time in years. The hotel was the site of secret political meetings, as well as a place where ordinary visitors from around the world could still find accommodation in wartime. Because my father had this agreement with the American ambassador, it was considered to be a U.S. hotel. As a result, it was never closed. It was open to Parisians, to everybody. In spite of all the restrictions, the Bristol was flourishing again, the only hotel in the city to do so. Many Jewish citizens were already fleeing from the Nazis. For some of them, Le Bristol became a place of refuge. Together with her aid organization, Anne Morgan, the daughter of famous American banker J.P. Morgan, arranged lodgings at the hotel for numerous Jews from 1940 to 41. They were later evacuated to the U.S. But Hippolyte Jamais also secretly stowed away another Jewish citizen. His name was Léo Lermain. The Jew he hid was his architect, Monsieur Lermann. He created the new restaurant that still exists today. Monsieur Lermann lived in room 106 for the entire duration of the war. He sent his family, his children, to Switzerland. He was the only one in his family who stayed in Paris. My father put him up and paid him as a full-time employee. At 
The elevator's wrought iron grill is the work of Léo Lermont, as are many other features still in existence at the Bristol today. For a full four years, Lermont lived in hiding here. And during this time, he renovated a large part of the hotel. He was an extraordinary man. Even today, you can't walk through this hotel without mentioning him. Though Lermont himself had to keep his wanderings here to a minimum. The funniest thing is that he kept on working for Le Bristol, just at night. So he walked through the hallways at night. He designed the wrought iron grill on the Bristol's elevator during this time. At the end of the war, he left the hotel as a free man. Lermont renovated 50 rooms during his years at Le Bristol. Apparently, he was a man who could walk into an existing room and, in the blink of an eye, knew just what could be done to make it even more pleasant. Right under the noses of the German occupiers and other guests, he bravely and secretly supervised the renovations from his hotel room. Back then, no one was to know he was there, because little indiscretions are quickly committed. People are only human, after all. But Monsieur Jamais even made his room number disappear entirely, so that in people's minds, this room didn't even exist. Room 106? No, there's room 105, but 106 doesn't exist. It's not known what happened to Léo Lermont after the war, and Hippolyte Jamais never breathed a word about this incredible story. I think that for him to have taken the risk, because it was a risk for which Monsieur Germain could have paid a heavy price, they must have been more than casual acquaintances. Over time, they became quite close. There are certain cases like this of French people who saved other French Jews. We call this microhistory. But I think these little stories give this hotel a history and humanity. I think we also have a need to show that such cases of solidarity exist, that this hotel saved a man's life. When the United States entered the war in December 1941, the situation changed yet again, for Hippolyte Jamais and his hotel, too. The Bristol, which had previously been neutral territory, now catered to the German embassy's guests. So after the war, Hippolyte was accused of collaborating with the Nazis, as he was under the command of the chief of protocol of the German embassy in Paris, Fritz Bodo. For a time, he had to work together with this chief of protocol from the German embassy in Paris, who was visibly very harsh, even in his contact with Hippolyte Jamais. Unfortunately, observers didn't catch on to that right away, which you can understand at such an overwhelming time. I can only imagine that this kind of interaction in a hotel that was supposedly a hotel for diplomats, neutral, protected, quiet, would raise lots and lots of questions. But afterwards it turned out the person in question was a double agent, I believe. Did he know Bodo was a German who spied for the French? Hippolyte Jamais kept his silence, even though he could have cleared his name. His discretion applied to everyone. Simone de Beauvoir lived in the hotel during the war. 
The Ritz is associated with personalities like Coco Chanel, who lived there for 30 years. It's similar with other hotels. With Le Maurice, it's Salvador Dali. But to my knowledge, the Bristol never used artists, intellectuals or painters to draw attention to itself. Nothing ever stuck, neither talk of collaboration nor secret stories about hidden people. Maybe because it's such a discreet place. And those who are very discreet leave no traces behind. As the end of the Second World War drew closer, Parisians longed for peace. And on August 25, 1944, their wish was granted with the liberation of Paris. By this time, Hippolyte Jamais had skillfully guided his hotel through 20 tumultuous years of history in the making. And in the final hours of the German occupation, he even helped to alter the course of history. Hitler's order to completely destroy Paris was not executed in the end, and Le Bristol played a part in this. In exchange for sparing the city, 150 German officers' wives were hidden from the French resistance at Le Bristol for a night and smuggled out of Paris unharmed. The man responsible for cutting the deal was Swedish Consul General Raoul Nordling, who knew Hippolyte Jamais and Le Bristol very well. Today, the hotel's role in this story is hardly known. Le Bristol has never boasted about this part of its history. Its focus remains on being the ideal luxury hotel. But Leo Lermont, the Jewish architect who found refuge here, left his mark on the Bristol's restaurant. In 1940, the hotel's coal store was located here. The room was badly damaged. Lermont covered the walls of the oval-shaped room with light-colored wood. He swapped the Art Deco furnishings for fine 18th-century-style furniture, giving the room a sense of elegance, warmth, intimacy, and distinction. Chef Eric Fréchon has made the Bristol's Epicure restaurant into a culinary temple, which holds three Michelin stars. Every day, table reservations are discussed. The restaurant is always fully booked. Who's coming? Are they VIPs? The waitstaff try out the new dishes on the menu. They must know exactly what they're serving and how it tastes. The wine selection must also be perfect. The sommelier coordinates it with the chef and the restaurant manager. Hippolyte Jamais was the only hotel owner in Paris who remained lord of his castle throughout the war. In the post-war period, the hotel's exceptionally good condition which owed much to Léo Lermont, led the French Foreign Ministry to officially designate Le Bristol as the place to stay when ambassadors and accredited diplomats visited the French capital. 
Paris was once again a major player on the international political stage, and visiting world leaders also needed hotel rooms. West German Chancellor Konrad Adenauer often stayed at Le Bristol. And it was here that he and French President Charles de Gaulle hammered out the final details of the Élysée Treaty, the friendship treaty between France and West Germany. I think from the start, Chancellor Adenauer had an apartment here. From the time he started coming to Paris regularly, though he didn't always physically occupy it. And after that, it was standard practice for all German chancellors to have an apartment in Paris. They didn't have to register or ask the ambassador to prepare for their arrival. It was like they were at home. In his day, Hippolyte Jamais met many great statesmen, including then U.S. President Harry Truman. Le Bristol was now a true luxury class hotel. Even today, politicians, including German Chancellor Angela Merkel, appreciate its relative seclusion. I think Le Bristol has always been a meeting place for the powerful due to its proximity to the Elysée Palace and the Interior Ministry. So the political world has always been here, the business world as well, because businessmen meet politicians in places of power. And a lot of galleries have set up shop nearby. One morning in May 1964, Hippolyte Jamais unexpectedly collapsed on the sidewalk. Two days later, after suffering a heart attack and a stroke, he died. From then on, his eldest son Pierre ran the family business. Pierre the young rebel became Pierre the hotel manager and husband. For Le Bristol, he flew around the world. Like his father before him, Pierre Jamais met with VIPs, like then future French president Jacques Chirac. But what would a luxury hotel be without a truly romantic love story? After Pierre's divorce from his first wife, Heidi entered his life. The young German woman was looking for a job at the Bristol in Paris, of all places. I left home at 19. I wasn't even of age. You only were at 21 back then and came to Paris. It was a 22-hour train trip to travel from Berlin to Paris, long enough to fly to America three times today. <laughs> When he finally received me, it took just half an hour, and I was hired. It all went quite fast. Have you done? No, you can't do that here. What do you want to do? I said, I don't care. Tell me what you want me to do. And that was it. Do you have a room? No, then you'll get one. Dinner, etc. In half an hour, I was out the door. Back then, Pierre Jamais was twice Heidi's age. But that proved no obstacle. It was love at first sight. How sweet. The couple married in 1966. Three years later, their daughter was born. The family enjoyed living in the hotel. They received the guests and represented and carried on Hippolyte Jamais's legacy. It was our passion. It was simply the nicest thing in the world. Pierre and Heidi continued to run the hotel through the 1960s and 70s. Back then, strict codes of conduct were still in place at luxury hotels. We actually wanted more of a quiet clientele. 
We did have actors, but not like they have today. It was all still a little old-fashioned. For example, no man could enter the restaurant without wearing a tie. Today, that's unthinkable. Later, Le Bristol got its own hair salon. And last but not least, something Hippolyte Jamais had always rejected out of hand, an in-house bar. My father with his diplomatic clientele did not want a bar in the Bristol. He was afraid that streetwalkers would come into the hotel. I opened the bar. In 1975, Josephine Baker celebrated her 50th stage anniversary in Paris. 250 invited guests came to Le Bristol to join in the revelry with the legendary American-born performer who found fame in France. Josephine Baker also celebrated the last evening of her life here. It was the last big soiree presided over by the Jamais family. We held the last dinner for Josephine Baker, who died the next day. Her funeral was held at La Madeleine. We had lots and lots of artists. Actress Cécile Sorel came down the stairs and asked, did I look good doing that? Lots of artists, too. Le Bristol now boasts one of the largest hotel wine cellars in France. Almost 100,000 bottles are stored here. 85% of them are French wines. Some 15 years ago, Le Bristol began producing its own house wine and has amassed quite a collection. Sommelier Bernard Neveu always finds just the right vintage to go with every meal served at the Epicure restaurant. Even Hippolyte Jamais wasn't averse to a glass or two. Of course, Le Bristol had a wine cellar back then, though it didn't have as many bottles. We've been lucky enough to acquire a large number of bottles. And through the great efforts of the chef, the restaurant was awarded with first two, then three Michelin stars. So we've really expanded our wine cellar because the demand is there. Clients who come to eat lunch or dinner at a three-star restaurant are connoisseurs when it comes to wine and gastronomy. So we must respond to that demand, and that's what we've done. Almost a century has passed since Le Bristol first opened its doors. In 1978, the Jamais family sold the hotel. In addition to Pierre, the managing director, Hippolyte had nine other children who stood to inherit their share. Today, Le Bristol is a five-star palace hotel, the highest hotel classification that exists in France. It's managed to retain its original character, discreet, unobtrusive, and laid back while moving with the times. Things have evolved. As you can see now, I'm the first female head concierge of a Parisian palace hotel. At the start, this was mainly a man's profession. Why? Because concierges used to work their way up from being porters, valets or bellboys. Back then they had to carry heavy loads, not the small ultralight suitcases we have today. So they were essentially all men. And then they had to park nice cars, which was also a male domain. But today there are schools which let young people, young women, train to be concierges and enable them to enter this profession. Sonia Pape's duties as concierge differ considerably from those of her predecessors. 
Maybe there was a telephone in the beginning, but maybe not. Then fax machines and telex. Communication was very different back then. And when you wanted to make a reservation at the restaurant, you had to know the phone number by heart, have the right contacts. I've been told that when they left an establishment, concierges sold their address books. They sold their positions with all the contacts that acquired as a concierge. Now, with the new social networks and the internet, our clients can get all the information they want. So our profession has changed entirely, as the clients are already experts. They already know what they want to do as soon as they arrive at the hotel. Le Bristol is open to all, yet retains an air of mystery. Woody Allen shot his film Midnight in Paris here, and A-listers like Leonardo DiCaprio are regular guests who can come and go virtually unnoticed. We've added a touch of glamour to Le Bristol in recent years. Before, things here were more masculine, diplomats, businessmen, high finance. And now we've given it a bit of glamour with the cinema, but while remaining very discreet. It all comes back to that aspect of being safe, of being sheltered from everything, even if you do something terrible, even if you leave here thinking you should never have done it. What happens here stays here. Word will never get out. And this aspect of silence, which we call discretion, is something that has always characterized us. And what's good is it's something that underlines the family aspect. What happens in a family stays in a family. Mm -hmm.